Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to today's webinar, What's Next? Data and Insight to Drive Next Best Actions. This is the first in our industry webinar series, one-on-one -on -one with H1. To sign up for future webinars, we invite you to visit www.h1.co. Before we get started, I'd like to go over a few housekeeping items so you know how to participate in today's event. We ask that all participants place their phone or computer on mute. However, this is an interactive event. We'd love to answer your questions during the duration of the webinar. So please feel free to type them in the chat. Today's event is also being recorded and you will receive a post-event email with today's recording and a brief survey. I would now like to introduce Rob Consalvo, H1 Senior Director of Sales Engineering. Today's event, What's Next? Data and Insights to Drive Next Best Actions, will explore how to support medical affairs teams in bringing medicine to market improving health equity and more. But where do you start? How do you build the next best action plan? And what common pitfalls can you avoid? Rob, you ready to get started? Absolutely, thank you. Uh, can you hear me all right? Just to make yeah. sure. All right, perfect. Um, well, thanks everyone for tuning in today. For those uh, folks watching along at home, uh, welcome. Uh, for those here with us, thank you guys for uh, for participating. Excited to, to have you with us today. Um, just to give you a quick uh, sort of introduction, uh, I am Rob Consalvo. Uh, I've been here at H1 for a pretty considerable amount of time uh, from, from some of our early, early days here as an organization. Uh, and I lead our sales engineering and enablement function today. So uh, really I help folks make uh, better decisions about how to leverage our data uh, to, to do the things that they need to do. And in particular, uh, today, I'm really excited to talk about next best action. Um, so a lot of folks that are uh, in industry are thinking about omnichannel engagement, uh, thinking about how do we get either information into the right hands uh, at the right time? How do we get uh, our engagement plans really dialed in? Uh, how do we leverage data more effectively? And uh, today, what we're going to talk about is uh, relatively high level, and we do have some, some questions for the audience, but, um, you know, really at the end of the day, uh, what we want folks to be able to, to walk away from here today is, you know, what do I need to do if I want to build out an NBA plan, Next Best Action NBA? Um, how, how can we leverage the right external data for this? Uh, what should we be focused on? What should we not be focused on? Are there things that we can avoid? Are there things that we should do specifically, right? All of these aspects are, are uh, pretty critical for understanding sort of where to take things uh, from a, a, a next best action planning process. Um, so in terms of time, just to make sure we're level setting here, uh, we have about another 25 minutes on the books. The whole presentation shouldn't be more than another 15 minutes or so. So we'll have plenty of time for questions or uh, anything else that may, may come up. So um, at the very least to get us started for the folks that are here and we only have a couple, um, are any of your organizations currently leveraging next best action? Is this something that's uh, relatively common within your organizations? Are folks thinking about this or they're doing this? Um, I'm just gonna take, uh, we'll take 30 seconds or so uh, if anyone wants to put a response in the chat. Elizabeth, is that the best way for huh. folks to, to reply? Yeah, Perfect. reply in the so. chat. Uh, and hey, can really, you hear me? Oh yeah, please go ahead. Hey, can you hear me okay? Yes, absolutely. Uh, this is uh, Eric Hill, I'm over at Zeev Healthcare. Hey Eric. Uh, how you doing? So um, yeah, we are leveraging next, next best action uh, right now. Yeah, awesome. Uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to having some additional uh, questions headed your way there, Eric, uh, but that's fantastic. Good stuff. How do you, do you guys think about it like regularly? Is this just kind of like a big thing? Do you have already a plan in place or is this sort of, uh, sort of uh, preliminary stuff so far? Uh, currently we're working with an outside um, agency and uh, we're mm -hmm. leveraging it with them, uh, ZS, uh, ZS Associates. That makes a lot of sense. Cool. Good stuff. All right. Uh, if there's anyone else that wants to share over the chat, uh, feel free to, to do that. Otherwise, I think it's uh, good for us to sort of jump in. So um, 
let's start talking about w- w- what NBA is, right? What's next best action? So um, realistically, the way that I like to think of this is it's really just the, the how and the when of your engagement planning. A lot of people are using data today to drive the what, right? What do I send this particular persona, right? A lot of folks do a lot of work around persona identification, defining who are the most relevant people to engage from a stakeholder perspective. That's the perfect first step, right? Really the the only way to know what you should be doing next, right? That next best action piece is to know who you should be doing that with, right? We really want to help you uncover that how and when from an engagement perspective, because that's what's going to drive uh, the strongest results from that what, from that curated thing that people are, are sending. But it's important to also note that next best action planning, it's not a silver bullet. And I, uh, I, I gave this conversation, this, this talk live in uh, Europe uh, two weeks ago. And I uh, asked the question if this is, if silver bullet is like a, a colloquialism just for the US or if it's an idiom just for the US. Uh, and I know that, you know, uh, according to Warren Zevon, there were werewolves in London, but for those folks international right now, uh, this, this piece is really important, right? This silver bullet, there is no silver bullet to engaging people effectively, right? Uh, this is an approach. It's a data-driven approach. It's designed to remove ambiguity. And uh, Eric, I'm sure based on your experience, right, it's really about uh, uh, keying in to those aspects that are going to be uh, critical for that decision-making process. And really at the end of the day, if you're already engaging stakeholders, right? If you're already doing things to communicate to people out in the field or people that you want to work with, you're doing some form of this, right? I know before uh, there was this uh, absolute abundance of data that folks could access, right? There were still plans about how and when and with what to engage people on. It was just a lot more uh, pen and paper. It's a lot more driven by uh, things that people hear or uh, things that you may just talk to someone about. And it's very siloed information that ultimately has led us to, to this place where we are, where we're able to, for, for lack of a better word, explode past that barrier. And really that comes from being able to leverage that massive amount of information that does exist out there today. So if you're starting from the ground up, right, there's really some core foundational aspects that are critical to start aggregating. Everyone on this call, I'm assuming, uh, if you're tuning in for this, you're either somewhat familiar with it or you're, you're moving towards uh, familiarity with this concept, right? But really, it's, it's that center, uh, it's that client-centric engagement component that's going to drive the success of this. So your goal, right, your goal for all of this is not that, that silver bullet, it's not to uh, get that, uh, that stat change, right, necessarily. It's about how do you increase the likelihood of improving that communication, right? And what a lot of folks that come to us to have this conversation about NBA talk about is CRM data. Uh, basically taking the information that you already know on the people that you're already engaging, right? Uh, That helps you to improve from a machine learning perspective, how you're going to uh, determine what uh, should be aligned to who, when, why, and how, right? Uh, Medical claims data. This is a really good way for folks to see what people are actually doing from a treatment perspective. Uh, That field insight, a lot of it comes from similar CRM data, but your CRM data can be quantitative, whereas your field insight can be qualitative. And being able to mine that qualitative data for relevant information, for preferences, for uh, uh, timetables for what folks are gonna be doing, right? Whether they're attending ASCO or uh, they're going to be doing some other large activity, right? Being able to, to tie that to those field insights or maybe just knowing uh, that there's going to be another individual that's going to be of, of relevance soon, right? Relative to that, that uh, person you're looking to engage. Uh, prescription level data, clinical trial data, competitive intelligence. And then the last one on here, and you know, just to, to put this out there relative to H1, is that HCP and HCO data. Now, all of these pieces are valuable, right? And it's important to note that all of these pieces independently are valuable. 
But the reason I put this HCP and HCO piece last on here is because I think it really is sort of that cornerstone that helps drive a lot of the building that folks can do. Because ultimately, one of the things that we've seen a lot of teams struggle with is building a unified source that they can go back to and say, yep, all of our data is aligned around that unique identifier, around that profile of information. And being able to tie all of those pieces together, it allows you to draw that insight from such a large pool of information that you have a better likelihood of narrowing in on that when and how. Remember, all of this information is predicated on the fact that you have a, a machine learning process that's going on behind the scenes to help you sift through all of this information. So with that, I wanna open it up and ask you just another question, right? We talked about uh, a whole host of, of data that's relevant and, and valuable from a next best action planning piece. What else? If folks on this call are, are either using it or they're familiar with it. Is there anything else that comes to mind from a data perspective that would be relevant? And if you wouldn't mind, uh, please just feel free to answer in the chat or if you wanna volunteer anything live, happy to hear that as well. Um, but the, the chat might be a, a nice way for us to go with the, the larger group. And we'll give everyone, I don't know, about 10, 10, 20 seconds if there's anything that anyone wants to add in the chat um, or if anyone wants to raise their hand and share an example, also happy to have that. Uh, feel free to, to, to add anything. Hey Rob, what are some examples you hear from our you know, customers about some data sources that they're, they're commonly using while we're waiting for people to answer? Yeah, so the things that are, are interesting to me um, are things that they have, like projects that they've done internally. So like uh, one organization that we worked with really wanted to uh, understand like the impact on the next generation of uh, thought leaders and, and people that they engage, because obviously there's, uh, you have your different engagement plans for different levels of, of thought leader, right? Um, and one of the things that they were really keen on is tying in uh, award data and patient advocacy group involvement data. And both of those pieces were really sort of critical for them with their sort of, uh, this was uh, 2020, late 2022, early 2023 planning that they were going under. Um, it was really critical for them to, to get all of that in line before continuing uh, the rest of the process. I know the patient advocacy piece is, is important for diversity as well. Yeah, absolutely. That diversity aspect. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. It also is critical for understanding some of that when, right, and the how piece, right? Because your when is often predicated on like what those individuals schedules look like. And if yes. they're involved in a lot of patient advocacy group activities, right, that's just another thing that you have to account for when you're doing your planning to make sure that you're engaging them most effectively. Right, right. Awesome. Well, just in the interest of time, folks, I'm gonna, I am going to press on, um, but we'll open it back up for questions towards the end of the presentation, if that's all right with everyone. So um, to start talking about optimization, right? Uh, there are a couple of things that I would recommend just sort of as the uh, holistic blanket things that you, you're going to want to do. So one, everyone should define their outcomes. There are specific things that people are going to obviously be looking to achieve. And knowing what those things are is critical, right? Knowing what you're aiming at helps you determine what you actually have to put into your quiver, so to speak, right? If you're thinking about it from the archery perspective, right? Um, then you have to know the audience. That's where collecting all of that data, building that unification, building out all of those different disparate data sources and unifying them together becomes critical. Uh, the next piece of this is going to be analyzing that information. So if you know what, you're, uh, what target you're, you're sort of aiming for and you know who uh, is basically going to help you reach that target, right? Uh, you're going to wanna start building out those queries to drive the outcomes established in step one. And then, and this is really critical, you're going to want to use those interactions to drive the next piece as well and the next phase. All of this information is, I, I don't wanna say useless in, in uh, isolation, but it's not nearly as valuable as nine or 10 iterations of this type of interaction, right? Being able to see, hey, maybe we overweighed too heavy on one aspect versus this other one later on helps you optimize that approach. And ultimately, this whole 
framework aligns very closely with your traditional omni-channel or next best action strategies as well, thinking not just of the identification piece, which is who are the right people to engage with, blah, 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 uh, but it takes you through that insight, engagement, and tracking piece as well, right? So thinking about what activities these people engage in, right? How do you determine that? You look at the data, you look at your CRM information, you look at uh, the publications that they may have done, you look at other uh, companies that have paid these individuals. You look at all of these different aspects. Then you look at those engagements. You look at what you've done with them. You've got a lot of this information on these individuals already. So how can you make some, some uh, efforts to move them more easily through topics, to move them more easily through uh, the phases of what you'd like to engage them on, right? It comes down to knowing those people really well, knowing what you're doing with them and knowing what others are doing with them as well. And ultimately that tracking piece, that successful engagement does require that iteration and the measure of impact over time to have the results that folks are looking to achieve when they're doing their next best action planning. So I wanna talk through a quick case study, something that we've done in this area, this is not all we've done in this area, we've done a lot of different things. But first I wanna just talk about H1 real quick for the folks who are perhaps not super familiar, right? Uh, we are a force that is uh, helping to democratize the access to information through our composable platform, right? We have all of these different dimensions, we have all of these different components, and we're able to compile them all together to help folks get the access to the information that's going to be most relevant to them as they're going through their day-to-day -day activities. And you can see we've got a whole host of information here from things on the uh, medical devices side and our, our sales side to our core HCP universe, which is our flagship, to getting things on, tri on clinical trials, generating proprietary insights from physicians themselves through faculty opinions, validating data through Precise, all of these different aspects play together. And again, create a more democratized approach to, to data which is really what we helped our client in this example dig in on. So as a, uh, just an example, we worked, this was a, a top five pharma that we worked with. And essentially what they came to us with the, the question of is how do we know that what we're doing is having the impact that we want it to have, right? It really is the core of the next best action concept, right? And to meet this need, we had to do a lot of steps before you even get to uh, the table, right? You have to, you have to cook the turkey. You have to set the table. You have to, uh, you know, prep everything ahead of time, and then you get to actually get to the table itself, right? So for our, our our table setting, right, we had to do a lot of discovery. We helped this client essentially uncover what those new targets were, uh, those rising stars. This is a different example than uh, than than the one I spoke to earlier, but same idea, right? Who are those people that are going to be relevant for the things that we're trying to accomplish, right? It's the first step uh, that I've outlined on those other slides as well, right? Uh, we were then able to take in some of the information that they had from their CRM, uh, from their business planning questions, from those high priority things uh, that were interactions within their CRM, right? Being able to tie all of that data together. So essentially what we did is we took our H1 data, which had our own unique identifiers, tied it to their unique identifiers, and built out this holistic system that unified the data across all of these different dimensions. And then we brought in some additional third parties, right? We brought in RX data, diagnostic data. We brought in a whole host of other uh, information as well that we were able to pull from different sources. We helped them to normalize all of this. And ultimately we were then able to uh, measure the impact that all of these different initiatives and activities were able to have for that client, right? We were able to look at their, uh, their information, the recorded data that they had uh, to show that over time, doing the, uh, the, the, the different cohorts, right, that were essentially done, they were able to see a significant uh, increase in results from that group that had the most well-defined and structured profiles of who the individuals were and the most rigid sort of path towards those actions that they were looking for them to take. And ultimately the result in this, this was a, a, a one-off small uh, implementation that we did initially, 
uh, grew to a very significant size, right? Multiple countries, multiple regions, multiple uh, uh, topics, even multiple therapeutic areas of focus because we were able to demonstrate that impact for this level. And what I hope everyone can take away from this, and then I'll open it up again to questions, are some of those aspects that are going to be uh, uh, critical as sort of defining the next steps, next best steps uh, for the folks who are, are listening in today or tuning in at home. So one, build a cross-functional understanding. This is foundational because right now, I guarantee for everyone who's listening to this, there are data silos within your organization. Even within data-oriented companies, there are data silos that exist within those organizations. And knowing who has which data and what they plan to do with it is really critical for understanding what you can do as a organization holistically. And I know there are firewalls and I know there are challenges with always being able to access this information, but I think it's if it's a, a data and digital driven decision in the organization to focus and prioritize on leveraging this type of information, I think the case can be made to build more of a cross-functional collaboration on this. The second thing is that strategic deployment. So as I mentioned, right, that case study was not done with a large portion of the organization to start. It was done in a, uh, a smaller area, right? And I know I just said, get rid of those data silos, but they can also be helpful if you can't for building out a strategic deployment to generate the, uh, the ROI, to generate the support for this topic and basically get you off on the right footing, right? You can choose a team that you know will have uh, at least some uh, data fluency and willingness to adopt some novel things, right? And use that as your place to deploy. Uh, I like to also, uh, our third thing here is OMER, right? Objectives, measure, engage, review. This is your uh, framework for uh, next best action planning. What are you trying to do? How are you gonna measure it? How are you going to engage these individuals and how are you going to incorporate all that back in? And you can answer those four questions. Those are really sort of those foundational pieces that you need to at least start assigning uh, some actions to, to your framework. And then the final thing here, and this is, uh, I think, very valuable, is this parallel work streams. If you're waiting to start on something, maybe you say, well, we're going to be launching a new CRM, or we're going to be launching a new vendor for whatever product that we're going to be offering, or we're waiting on an agency of record, or we're waiting on X, Y, and Z, right? Uh, I don't necessarily think that waiting uh, is always the, the best way to approach on this. I think there's reasons to wait. You want to build consensus, you want to build uh, support, and you want to sort of move things forward in the most effective way. But there are ways to run parallel work streams in this to where you can begin the work of launching an XPEX action plan or an omni-channel plan or some other form of engagement planning process while not necessarily allowing those uh, more structural or bureaucratic issues to get in the way of that progress that teams are looking to make. And I know all of these uh, are, are easy to say, not necessarily easy to implement, but uh, one of the things that uh, I'm always happy to do is answer questions, uh, whether that's today or outside of today, uh, to give folks some, some clarity on how to approach this. Um, Elizabeth, I can yeah, take it back over. Yeah. Um, we had a couple of questions uh, before the event. Okay. Um, one is, why is it important to look beyond traditional KOLs? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, uh, the, the example I gave before, uh, where we were able to look at those rising stars, I think it's a good example. Um, traditional KOLs are inundated already. They're a part of everyone's plan. Uh, they're often the plan when it comes to engagement for the most part. Um, what we've seen over the past three years is folks are starting to be more and more concerned about your non-traditional folks as well. So digital opinion leadership, uh, treatment landscape people, people who are more involved like a community level, um, rising stars I mentioned before, but like being able to tie all of those different non-traditional folks to your engagement planning process, whether that's uh, at an institutional level, just giving you a map of like how uh, that institution is structured or just giving you some other ins that you might not necessarily have, or even just a path to engage someone who is going to become more significant of an influencer from a, a whatever perspective that might be. 
right? This gives you the opportunity to actually know what it looks like on the ground, as opposed to just making the assumption that that key thought leader, that top level person owns and controls all of that influence, which is just not true in today's sort of digital and more democratized world from a data perspective. Great. And do you have a best practices approach um, that Metafairs can use to measure the impact? Uh, yeah, so that one's real hard. Uh, <laughs> don't get me wrong. Uh, I'd love to say, yep, we've got that one completely cracked. We have some great ideas. Don't get me wrong. Uh, you can look at uh, publication data, uh, claims data, uh, and industry interactions with your CRM information. So essentially, uh, the most basic version of this is uh, a, it's, it's a single feedback loop where you've got uh, your activity that you did with a particular individual, and then you know all the things that that individual has done outside of your interaction. And you say, okay, uh, if I met with them in May, and I want to review what they did since uh, then in August, right? I can have uh, uh, an idea that my interaction may have influenced a shift in their, their thought share. Uh, there's yeah. way more to that. So like if anyone else wants to have a conversation about this, uh, it's definitely something that we'd love to, to dig in on more. And the last one was, how do you move from traditional Medicare's phone calls and paperwork to data insights? Where do you begin? Uh, it's a really good question, but for, <laughs> uh, believe it or not, and I don't think this is going to be the case for most of the folks on the line, if you're forward thinking from a data perspective, uh, centralized CRM data is often like a place that a lot of folks don't necessarily realize they need to start. Um, but one of the projects that we did in this area, uh, organization didn't have a way to capture their business questions or their business assessment questions from their, their audience. That's the, the first step basically is having a digital repository that all of this information can go into. And I know it creates uh, a pain of change, right? There is a, a, a burden of that change of adopting a digital practice. But if there's a uh, value seen in leveraging data to drive these outcomes, that's almost the price of admission, right? Being able to have a digital repository that you can then go back to. Great, great. Any additional questions, feel free to type them in the chat. And can you go to our last slide, Rob? Absolutely. There we go. These are all the ways that you can connect with H1. And um, thank you, Rob, and thank you everyone for attending. Um, if you'd like to learn more about H1 and how we can help drive the next best action, you can visit www.h1.co or you can email Rob directly at robert.consalvo at h1.co. You'll also receive a follow-up email within 24 to 48 hours with a link to view a recording of today's webinar, as well as a survey. And we would appreciate it if you would complete that and provide your feedback. And on behalf of H1, thank you for joining us and have a great rest of your day. Thanks, everyone. Thanks.